Yesterday's field trip to the Natural History Museum was the coolest. Look at the giant sloth I bought at the gift shop. He's totally covered in fur, just like my Uncle Mort. I got a Tyrannosaurus Rex. A little obvious, perhaps, but look at those teeth. I got a Spinosaurus, and it doubles as a fan. I got a cheese board. What? It's got a tiny Brachiosaurus carved right where the quince paste should go. Yeah, that's cool. Whatever. Brachiosaurus is way older than your dinosaur. Every connoisseur of cheese, or cheesophile as we are called, knows older is better. Oh, please, they're dinosaurs. They all basically lived around the same time. Actually, Justine, Brachiosaurus and T-Rex lived millions of years apart and never walked the Earth at the same time. In fact, there's less time separating a Mars Tyrannosaurus and modern humans than there was between T-Rex and Brachiosaurus. Pretty wild, huh? Uh, wait a minute. But paleontologists dig up bones and fossils of all dinosaurs from the same place, old rocks. Plus, all the dinosaurs were in the same clearance bin. You see, here we are in the present. And here is T-Rex, which lived in the late Cretaceous period, about 67 million years ago. And way back here is Brachiosaurus, which lived in the late Jurassic period, about 150 million years ago. But they're still all Dinosaurs. Oh, hey, Gummerson. Why do I get the feeling I've opened a can of worms with this one? I won't argue with you there, Isabella. Though this is one worm can worth opening. See, when it comes to the history of Earth's existence, we're talking about a time frame of 4.6 billion years. That's deep time. It's a magnitude we're simply not used to dealing with. That makes sense. I can't even guess how many jelly beans are in the carnival fishbowl without being off by a couple hundred thousand. Exactly. So sure, you can toss out a bunch of facts. The first bacteria popped up 3.5 billion years ago. Land plants evolved 420 million years ago. The dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago. Unfortunately, most students will still tend to think of events in the history of the Earth simply as extremely ancient or less ancient. They may know that the first mammals arose before humans, without having any sense of the relative space between those events. They may be able to recite that the Pangaea supercontinent began breaking up 200 million years ago without being able to meaningfully grasp how long that process took. <coughs> Slothball. In other words, studying raw dates and lists of eras doesn't provide much in the way of context or proportion. Not only that, but it divorces those geologic events from the supporting evidence, the how-we-know aspect of science. All that can make deep time seem drier than a buttermilk biscuit without the buttermilk. I can totally see why my students are having so much trouble with this. But honestly, just how important is it for them to understand the distant past? As my friend Blossom would say, shouldn't we focus on the now? You have a point there. But having an understanding of deep time is an example of what's called a threshold concept. Or an understanding that fundamentally shifts a person's way of seeing the world. Well, you can see another example in our modern understanding of the solar system. Prior to the Renaissance, the dominant concept of the solar system was terra-centric, meaning people assumed we were at the center of it all, with the sun and planets revolving around the Earth. Then, along came Nicolaus Copernicus, who developed the heliocentric model, and our perspective fundamentally shifted. This concept not only changed our understanding of the solar system, but also impacted countless other areas of thought extending across scientific disciplines. Deep time is a challenging concept, but helping students understand deep time buys a lot in terms of the big concepts it unlocks for students. 
It can help teachers explain how a giraffe, a finch, a frog, and a lemur can actually be related, if you look back far enough. It can help explain how continental drift can contribute to vastly different ecosystems and environmental conditions, a central aspect of Earth's history. Well, it can even help students understand how climate change might play out long term, beyond the spans of their lifetimes. Wow, that's a lot of bang for your scientific buck. But is it really possible to absorb an idea that big or that deep over the course of a school year? Well, like all new ideas, mastery of threshold concepts can be difficult and often runs up against deep-rooted misconceptions. The good news is, once understood, these ideas tend to stick for good. Allowing students to make new perceptions and connections that transform their understanding of the world. I guess the question is, what's the best place to start? Well, to begin with, don't get overly caught up in having students memorize geological epochs by name and sequence. Can I tell you a secret? I have trouble keeping the different eras straight myself. I think we all do. Though, as far as secrets go, that one's not exactly a humdinger. Okay, so one time, after a very intensive gluing project, I switched out three of my dried up glue sticks with less dried out ones in the supply closet. <laughs> It's a relief to come clean. Mmm, fresh glue sticks. Hot stuff. Now, where were we? Ah, yes. And perhaps one of the most helpful deep time tools is the use of properly supported analogies. Yes. I always love John McPhee's way of describing Earth's history as the length of an arm. One stroke of a nail file erases human history. Oops. Uh, certainly paints a picture, don't it? That's because the most effective analogies are the ones where corresponding elements in the source and the target align pretty easily. These analogies are great and actually kind of poetic, but surely I can teach my students some dates, right? <laughs> of course. Just make sure they get a chance to learn about both absolute time, the specific dates of certain events, and relative time, the sequence of the events relative to one another. That way, students can start to understand the basic outline of Earth's history while developing an idea of the space between its key events. Oh man, this is super helpful, Gummo. Though I have to admit, it's all still kind of daunting. Oh, you got this. Remember, you don't have to do it all at once. In fact, it's better to weave opportunities to grapple with deep time throughout the curriculum and across various science topics. And don't think I won't capitalize on my students' natural interest in things like dinosaurs and volcanoes to provide a little extra motivation for grappling with this difficult idea. Now we're cooking with gas. So, what do you say, Izzy? I say, let's do this thing. Okay, change of plans, gang. We're going to construct a geologic timeline so big it won't even fit in the classroom. Grab some construction paper and markers because we're headed outside. Yeah! Oh, yeah. Outside. What are you talking about? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, excited. To discover more about how kids learn science and the types of misconceptions they might have, visit us online at scienceeducation.si.edu forward slash good thinking.